So I'm Steffen, and today I want to talk about uh, some of the design work we did for our stablecoin that's called Gyroscope. Um, and this is joint work with my co-founder, Arya Klagesmund. So um, imagine you want to build a stablecoin. So you have, a, you have a cryptocurrency, and you want to keep it stable. And in some sense, this is always going to look like this. You have some kind of reserve of assets, and then people can mint and redeem coins against that assets. Um, and that's going to stabilize the price, right? If the price is too high, they can, um, they can mint new coins. If the price is too low, they can redeem coins. It's going to stabilize the market price. Um, and we call the primary market mechanism, <coughs> excuse me, the primary market mechanism, the thing that grants access to these assets and that um, intermediates between um, minters and redeemers, which are basically arbitrageurs and the asset reserve. Um, now, what are these assets? Well, that depends on your design. Um, it could be many different things in a Senurich uh, share design. Um, it could be, it's basically an equity share in a sense. Um, for something like a basis design, it's something like a bond. Um, and in a reserve back design, it's some portfolio of other assets. And by the way, this is a design we are using for gyroscope, it's reserve backed. Um, now, there are different situations we need to look at. Um, the kind of boring case is when the system is fully collateralized and all the assets are perfectly liquid, uh, because then this is just uh, basically a pricing problem, price the reserve assets. Um, and the somewhat more tricky case is the system might be 100% collateralized, but not all of these assets might be liquid, so you cannot necessarily pay them out when people redeem. Um, and then there's the crisis situation where the system actually becomes under-collateralized, and then you need to decide what to do. And uh, my talk is going to be about the design of this component that basically designs what to do in such a situation. Um, <coughs> what we are implementing for Gyroscope is a reserve of only liquid assets, so we are not really considering this case, but it would be um, a maybe straightforward extension of what we're doing. So let's look at some examples of this. Um, if you look at DAI, um, you have the PSM, or Pack Stability Mechanism, and it basically looks like this, that your reserve um, almost only consists of USDC. And this is what people sometimes say, that DAI has become, or is going in the direction of wrapped USDC. Um, the, the numbers are like 60% are like the PSM USDC, then you have another 20% of LP shares against USDC. And of course, in that situation, um, something you need to ask is, are there many risks associated with that? So for USDC, for example, there could be some regulatory risk, um, which may amount to counterparty risk, censorship risk, and so on. Um, kind of the goal of Gyroscope was to build something like a PSM 2.0. So how might you improve on this design? And I think there are like two ways. Um, the first thing is you may want to diversify your reserves. You may not want to hold only USDC. Um, and the second thing is to implement something like a programmatic risk control that uh, reacts autonomously to market conditions. Um, so that, that kind of can be seen in two parts. The first one is um, if you have uh, in DAI the different PSM vaults are independent, um, but you probably want to coordinate them somehow to react in the same way to market strategies. Um, and the other one is um, to price the stable coin depending on market conditions, especially when the system, should the system become under-reserved. And, and this is kind of where we're going. So kind of to, to build such a system, there are like many different challenges, and I just want to give you like the, um, the super quick overview. Um, basically, we want a picture, right? So we have a reserve that consists of uh, different uh, asset classes that are probably structured in some way. <coughs> And then you need to answer several questions, like which of these, which assets should that be, um, which risks are these exposed to, how to structure the whole thing so that the risks are somehow contained, um, how do you generate yield on, this, on the whole structure, uh, you probably want to price these things with oracles and so on. These are all things I'm not going to talk about, but questions we still had to answer for gyroscope, uh, and today I want to answer um, this mechanism. Basically the question is, someone comes to your system, the system may be under-reserved, um, illiquid to some degree, um, they want to redeem a stable coin, 
what is the amount of assets you offer them. Um, and to do that, we introduce a more general tool, which is what we call the redemption curve. And this is a general tool to analyze any stable coin design, basically. Um, so the redemption curve is um, the following curve. You have two axes. On one axis, you have the redemption level, which is basically the amount of stable coins that are getting redeemed. Um, and on the other axis, you have the redemption price that the mechanism offers to the redeemer. Um, and now we assume, um, now we look at what happens when people redeem more and more, um, and market conditions don't change for the beginning. Uh, so nothing happens, uh, no prices change, but people just redeem more and more. And <clears throat> ideally, of course, what you want is uh, this curve. You can always redeem at a dollar because then you always stabilize your pack at exactly a dollar. Um, and the higher your curvature here is, the less you support the peg um, as more and more people redeem. Um, kind of the default that um, is also happening for peg fiat currency is that you try to support the peg as long as possible until your reserve is empty, and then you don't support it anymore. Um, and, and kind of my argument will be that maybe this redemption curve is not ideal, and many other redemption curves aren't ideal either. So um, we, we can see kind of this, this type of curve or that type of behavior in the, in the <laughs> real world or in the fiat world. Um, for example, the, the attack on the British pound in the 90s was basically um, a continuous outflow um, from, the, from the British pound, basically a continuous redemption of pounds against other assets until the central bank was no longer willing to support the peg. Um, and then you see this, this kind of drop where uh, some people made a lot of money. I think the recent crash of the pound is probably not like that. I can't say anything about that. Um, <clears throat> if, we look at, if we look at stable coins, um, we've seen similar behaviors. This chart is like a little bit outdated, um, but there was this period in like 2021 where like many creative stable coin designs were created and many of them crashed and in, a, in a somewhat similar way very abruptly. Um, I want to look at one like design case study, which would be Fay, the original design of Fay, which was also not very successful in its original form. Um, <clears throat> and so Fay had these direct incentives, which basically means um, the the more of pack the whole system is, the worse the price you're getting. Um, and that, if you kind of look at it, this leads to a redemption curve that is very steep and that looks about like this, which means that your pack is not going to be stabilized very long. And then they removed the direct incentives, and then their um, redemption curve looked much, uh, much less uh, steep. Um, and we can see kind of the effect of these like steep redemption curve here. I hope this is kind of visible. This is like the price of Faye after launch, um, and it had like a like a huge uh, price drop with a lot of volatility. Um, I should probably talk about the the elephant in the room, or maybe not an elephant anymore. Um, Senurid shares. And the way I think about Senurid shares is essentially um, that you redeem at $1, but your backing is an endogenous asset that's basically uh, very, very tied into your project itself. And this can lead to some negative feedback spirals. Um, so essentially, it's the same story as from the fiat world before. <clears throat> um, you provide redemption at $1 until the willingness of the market to buy your Senurid shares is exhausted. Um, and then you basically crash very rapidly. And I should probably show this. Um, <coughs> right. Um, th this is the, the supply, right? You have this supply inflation at the same moment, but it doesn't really matter because people don't want to, the amount of senior shares people want to buy doesn't increase. Uh, or the amount of dollars people want to put into senior shares, I should say. Um, I, I should point out one thing about this particular talk. This was when I gave the first version of this talk. Um, this was not without precedent. Uh, we had a very similar system uh, called Iron, uh, you may remember, which also crashed in a very similar way. So here you have the stable coin um, that crashed, and at the same time, um, the endogenous collateral uh, crashed also. Um, so so that, that's not good, and that's why we made gyroscope reserve backed. Um, and the basic idea of what I want to talk about today is maybe we should think about the redemption curve as a design problem. And maybe we should 
choose a redemption curve that we think is useful and reasonable, and then we go and implement that in our primary market maker. Um, <coughs> so the, the basic design is going to look like this, right? You remember this picture? Um, and we're assuming that the assets here are exogenous, so we don't need to worry about these feedback effects. But what do you want to do if the system is under collateralized or illiquid? Um, and we have like, like, I want to give you these results in three parts. Um, first, we thought about what are actually desiderata for a good uh, redemption curve. What do we really want? Um, then I'm going to show you one such curve that satisfies the, the desiderata. And then I'm going to talk to you about how to actually implement that. Because as you remember, the redemption curve assumes that no market condition change over time. And of course, that doesn't happen in reality. So the step from picking a curve and then implementing it is, is making it dynamic. And this is going to lead to this type of dynamic bonding curve, if you want to think about it like that. Um, great. Let's first think about what we would ideally want of our redemption curve. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I want to I note is that probably your collateralization should be uh, should stay above some lower bound. Your redemption, shift, redemption curve should not exhaust your reserve, if that's at all possible. And the reason for that is to enable the system to recover later. You, if you exhaust your reserve, you're basically uh, destroying your, your system. And that's bad. Um, and then you probably also want the redemption price to stay above a lower bound, um, if that's possible, to support the pack, at least to some degree. Um, of course, this is trivial. We usually want our stablecoin to be stable at a dollar. Um, you probably want some continu continuity of that curve. You probably don't want these ab abrupt crashes. And um, I would say that the main reason for that is uh, to prevent speculation, because these kind of discontinuous crashes are something people could speculate on very easily. Um, and that could also lead to like all kinds of market upheavals. Um, <clears throat> and, and then this is like a little bit of a bonus but you want your redemption curve to be easy to use. So probably what you want is um, you want the, the execution. If you redeem uh, a certain amount of, uh, certain amount of uh, stable coins, our stable coin is going to be called Jive Dolls. Apology for that. Um, you probably want that to be easy, and especially you don't want there to be an incentive to subdivide your redemptions and to be somehow clever about the way how people redeem. Um, <clears throat> we have like a few bonus desiderata that are um, with respect to like several transactions or, or several blocks. Um, you probably want your, the, the reserve exhaustion to take a long time, unless, of course, your reserve just, just crashes. So the system should uh, also kind of think about what, what, happens, what happens tomorrow, what happens when the system runs continuously. Um, you should be able to regain your peg. And of course, you need to implement the whole thing on chain. Um, ah, yes, the first math equation. So before I show you, uh, how we implement this, I have to introduce this nice equation. Um, we assume that the redemption pressure is computed as a time discounted um, sum. If you don't care about that, that's totally fine. And now I'm going to show you one simplified design that satisfies almost all of the desiderata. Um, and this is the simplified redemption curve. We're not using this, but it's good for explanation. So what the curve does is that we support <clears throat> uh, a price of one dollar, so people can redeem at a price of one dollar, um, up until a certain amount of redemption. So on this axis, we have redemptions, um, and then we are gonna drop the redemption price, so that re the redemption price is equal to the collateralization ratio. And this is a sustainable way of doing it. So for example, if your system's 80% collateralized, the redemption price would be 80 cents, and you can just do that indefinitely and redeem the rest of the money. And of course, this has um, all of the nice uh, properties, almost all of them. Um, you, don't run out of, uh, you don't run out of reserves. Um, you can actually configure a trade-off that exists here. Of course, the longer you support a pack of $1, um, the lower your eventual collateralization is going to be. But it's something that uh, you can choose. Um, exactly. So, so we, we have like this long-term survivability of the system. Um, if you want, actually want to do this, like this would be like the equation. Um, but of course, the problem is that this is like this ugly discontinuous jump that I mentioned before. And so what we really do is that we introduce a linear segment there. Looks like this. Um, <clears throat> where the price would first be a dollar, then it would 
decrease as more and more is redeemed, and then um, if, it, if it has reached uh, a point where we have a sustainable collateralization ratio, it would just give you that price. Um, and if you want to do that, <coughs> the math to do this uh, looks like this. Um, but it's like, it's fine, right? It's fine. There are like case distinctions and fractions, but it's not that bad. Um, and one thing you, you, you can see here is that um, governance co can configure this using some hyperparameters. So um, you can say, what is the minimum collateralization that I want of my system? Um, and this is something that governance would set because it's actually a meaningful parameter. You can say, um, what is the steepness here that I'm willing to tolerate um, another parameter? And then if you solve these equations, it's going to respond autonomously to these hyperparameters. Um, now, this curve is beautiful, but it has um, a problem. It's not very useful because it doesn't reflect reality, because we assume there is a redemption pressure of zero. Um, we have some kind of initial collateralization of the system, which we call an anchor rate, or we, call, we label this like RA. Um, and then you start from there. The curve tells you what happens when you start at zero redemption pressure at the anchor rate. Nothing changes in the market. Um, to implement that, um, we need to live in a situation where the market will, of course, change, and we can still use this curve. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. So the goal is uh, make the whole thing dynamic, um, make it react to the current market state. And I'm going to show you how to do it, hopefully in a picture. <clears throat> and how we do it goes as follows. Um, I showed you this curve. And if you know your anchor collateralization, which is on this axis, um, and you know a certain amount of redemption pressure, then you can go and integrate the curve from before, and it's going to tell you what your collateralization at that point is going to be. And that's up here. Um, and now if we do that for all possible <coughs> sorry, anchor values, we get a three-dimensional surface. Um, and what we just discussed was if you know this and this, you can compute this. But it turns out that you can also do it in reverse. So if you know the current collateralization of the system on this axis and the current redemption pressure here, which is something that you can just observe in, in real time, then you can actually compute this initial uh, collateralization ratio, which of course at this point is a purely, it's purely a modeling tool. But it tells you if n nothing had happened in the market, and we are now at the state where should we have started if this model was true. OK, so, so many complicated words here. Um, and so basically, this theorem says that you can uh, reconstruct that. It's a monotonicity argument. Um, it's, it's fine. And, and so then, once you have the initial state, um, we can offer redemption prices um, based, on, uh, uh, based on this uh, redemption curve as a model. Um, and that's pretty convenient. Um, because it's a way to respond to current market conditions. It's completely autonomous. Governance only has to set uh, meaningful hyperparameters. It doesn't have to do anything in the moment. Um, and it's, it's completely predictable for other people, so everyone knows what's going to happen. So you have, this, you have this huge transparency advantage over a system where governance would just come in and then uh, make a vote. And of course, other market participants have no idea what the outcome of this vote is going to be. Now I should probably talk about implementation, because you might be looking at this theorem, and you're like, yeah, this is great if you're doing pure math. Um, but we're not doing that at all. And I'm going to talk a little bit about implementation. And the implementation works in two steps. The first like, core idea is that um, you saw, you remember the scary slide I showed you before with the like, many formulas, where everyone in the room gasped. So that had a couple of case distinctions in it. And if you uh, do like the cross product of all the case distinctions, you end up with a bunch of regions, and you can partition um, your space into all of these different regions. And um, so you, you may believe me that this is possible. Um, the theorem is that you can actually detect in which region you are based on only the current market state. 
Um, and then it turns out that once you know in which region you are, um, computing like this value on this axis is very easy. It's basically solving quadratic equations then. Um, and that brings us to the algorithm. So we detect the region based on the current state. <coughs> we reconstruct the anchor state. We take that as a model. Um, and we compute our redemption amount, which is basically integrating over this zigzag curve I showed you before. Um, and then when you like, are being very careful and you count all the things you have to do to get this, is actually very cheap. You just need to do some arithmetic and a little bit square root. Um, right. So this system has a number of interesting properties. And um, I'm going to show you just, just like two. Um, one result that you get like very easily is that there's no incentive to split up redemptions. And like mathematically, that's because you're computing an integral, and you can always split up an integral in different parts. And it doesn't matter um, if you compute the parts or the whole thing. So uh, mathematically, it's not very interesting. Um, you have a path deficiency result, um, which is basically that, um, and this is like a little bit more interesting, that the protocol state is going to improve over time. So if you implement the system, um, your reserve does not crash um, completely to zero. Um, and people just come and redeem, then your system is going to recapitalize itself over time. And of course, this is exactly what we want. We want long-term survivability of the system. And um, this is what this looks like. And now I want to conclude. Um, so if you're taking away anything from this talk, it's that you can design your redemption curves when you're building a stablecoin system. Um, and this is a very attractive way to get good properties of your system. It's also a very useful tool to compare different stablecoins um, and to think about if the stablecoin design is actually solid. Um, I showed you a, a design for one desirable redemption curve, um, and then I showed you how to make that dynamic and make it react to market conditions. Um, and if you want to um, kind of be be involved into how we actually do these things. We have implemented this in Gyroscope's dynamic stability mechanism. Gyroscope is our new stablecoin. Launch is planned towards the end of the year. Um, and uh, hopefully, all these properties are going to make a Gyroscope very robust. If you're interested in the paper, um, you should scan this QR code. And if you want to get in touch with us, you can go here um, or follow us here. Uh, you. Why did you guys choose a like a piecewise linear <coughs> approach, for example, and not something that's really smooth, like a sigmoid or something like that? Um, Are there nice properties that you get out of the, this uh, than you would not yeah. get otherwise? Yeah, let me ju just jump back to the um, slide. So the, um, should I give the honest answer or the lie? No, I'm going to give the honest answer. <laughs> so the honest answer is because it's easy to implement. Um, because, and like the, the reason is that this is linear, so it's integral, it's quadratic. And solving quadratic equations is easy, and solving anything else is is hard. So I have more of a philosophical question. In the last, let's say, two or three centuries, the tendency in the state-backed uh, currencies has always been to leave pegging to go toward uh, free-floating money. Why do you think that in the crypto economy we are seeing <coughs> a resurgence of peg money that seem to be quite prevalent? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a deep question. <laughs> Wasn't expecting that. <laughs> um, why, why do we have a resurgence of, of packed coins? Um, I think my intuition is that people think in USD or in some other fiat currency that is not really represented in crypto. Maybe at some point we have a crypto native currency um, that that doesn't need a peg because it's very stable against other fiat currencies. But I think we're not there yet. And that's why we need to represent some, um, some kind of measure, some kind of numeraire that people are familiar with and that matters in people's lives. Yeah, let me just add a little bit to that. So uh, <coughs> it's a common strategy when you're kind of like developing a new economy to do something like a currency peg. And it seems to work well in those situations because people want to use a more trusted uh, unit of account, like a dollar. And so I think that has a large influence here. But I also just want to note that the, uh, the autonomous monetary policy that we've been developing uh, can be more general than just maintaining a, uh, a currency peg. You can choose parameters in different ways 
uh, to do more arbitrary monetary policy too. Uh, I would want to know how do you think about once the system gets under stress and you, you get to the redemption <coughs> price, like w what would be the, the mechanisms or the incentive to, because it's kind of a, a I think there is some loss of trust in the market at that point. Uh, how, do you, how do you think about how to regenerate the system and, and getting back to the peg? Like this? Yeah, so the, the, the gyroscope design contains a number of, the, of other uh, like lines of defense and sort of ways that, uh, that the reserve could replenish over time. Um, and so basically this monetary policy, the idea is to buy the system time uh, so that those other mechanisms might be able to kick in. Uh, some examples of that is basically like uh, reserve assets are deployed in risk segregated ways, but they can still potentially earn some yield. And so there's sort of a tendency to increase uh, collateralization over time because of that. And then there's also sort of this idea of uh, forward guidance from the, the, the monetary policy itself. Like basically, the, uh, as the out level of outflows, this like time discounted sum that, uh, that Stefan was saying, decreases over time, then there's upward pressure on the peg from the reserve assets again, kind of according to this, uh, this, this policy. And then there's other mechanisms too. You can check it out in our docs. And happy to talk more after, uh, after this as well.